Welcome to another episode of History with Lennox, and today we're talking about a very important event or time period in U.S. history. It's the period where we finally determine what is the role of the judiciary in this brand new U.S. government that we've created. So let's get started. Welcome to John Marshall's court, or what I like to refer to it as the Revenge of the Federalists. Now, in 1789, during Washington's presidency, the Judiciary Act is going to be passed. The purpose of the Judiciary Act was to create a purpose for the judicial branch. It actually created the judiciary. It created the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeals, and district courts in every single state. The Supreme Court is going to be the top court, and they're going to appoint six justices to serve on that court. John Jay will be appointed the very first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. The Court of Appeals will act as an intermediate level in the federal court system between the district and the Supreme Courts. The district courts are going to be the lowest level, and there will be a district court in each state. There's no appellate jurisdiction, meaning they can't hear previously decided cases. They have what's called original jurisdiction, meaning that the trial or the case originates in the district court. In contrast, both the courts of appeal and the Supreme Court have appellate jurisdiction. Today, our Supreme Court has nine justices. But before we get to that, let's look at how we determined what this Supreme Court is actually going to do. To understand that, we have to go back to the election of 1800, where Thomas Jefferson takes over as President of the United States. And we see a shift from a Federalist-controlled government at the executive and legislative branches to a Democratic-Republican-controlled government at the executive and legislative branches. Now, Jefferson, while running for office, had been quoted as saying, I shall, by the establishment of Republican principles, sink federalism into an abyss from which there shall be no resurrection. Now, members of the Federalist Party saw this as an absolute threat. They see Jefferson as the beginning of the end of the Federalist political party. And so what they understand once Jefferson is determined to be the next president of the United States is that the doomsday clock is ticking. Now, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with the doomsday clock. This is a fictitious clock that is set up to determine when nuclear disaster is going to hit the world. And every year, scientists come together and they move the clock a minute ahead or a minute behind or something like that. Generally, it's always about six minutes before midnight. But in Jefferson's time, the doomsday clock for the Federalist was the beginning of their end. That when that clock strikes midnight, when Jefferson becomes the President of the United States, the Federalist Party may cease to exist. So Adams and his Federalist-controlled Congress are going to do everything they can to protect their party. What we see after the election of Jefferson is what's known as a lame duck session. A lame duck session generally talks about the time period between an election and an inauguration. So if Jefferson was elected in November and he's not going to take office until March, that five-month period is known as the lame duck session. And what's going to happen is Adams and the Federalist Congress are going to try to get as many laws passed as they can before they have to give up their seats. And that happens every time there's a change in power in Congress or the presidency. Article 3, Section 1 talks about the judiciary. It says the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. That's what was going on in the Judiciary Act of 1789, is that Congress was exercising its power that was afforded to it from this part of the U.S. Constitution. Well, that power still exists during the lame duck session. And so Congress is going to pass what has become known as the Midnight Judges Act or the Judiciary Act of 1801. What Congress does under this legislation is they create 16 new federal courts completely within their power. And with that, that means they need 16 new judges appointed to that court. 
and that falls under the responsibility of President John Adams. John Adams is going to take this opportunity to appoint Federalist judges to those positions. And the idea is, even though Jefferson and the Republicans are coming in to take over the executive and legislative branch, the judicial branch will still primarily be held by Federalist-influenced judges. And that was the plan. John Marshall comes in right now. He had served as Secretary of State under John Adams. He was a Federalist, yet now he's going to be appointed as the new Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So this is an example of a Supreme Court Justice being appointed during a lame duck session, during an election year. The problem lies with all the other justices that had been appointed. You see, during this time, there was no electronics. So for a judge to be appointed, once he's approved, he gets, he gets his appointment from the Secretary of State. In this case, that was still John Marshall. John Marshall would sign that appointment and send it to the new justice. Well, because this was done so quickly, some of those appointments never got delivered. And a new Secretary of State came in. And in this case, it's going to be James Madison. James Madison takes on the role of Secretary of State under the new president, Thomas Jefferson. Well, one justice who did not get his appointment was William Marbury. He's one of those 16 federally appointed judges. He is going to demand his appointment. Well, his appointment was never made official, I guess, prior to Madison becoming in. So Madison says, I have the authority to say no to you. If it, what, you weren't appointed before this administration, well, this administration is not going to appoint you. So no, you're not going to get your federally appointed judgeship. Well, Marbury's having none of this, and he is going to sue the United States, specifically James Madison, demanding that his appointment be delivered. What he's asking the Supreme Court to do under the Judiciary Act of 1789 is to issue what's called a writ of mandamus. A writ of mandamus is basically a court order that is issued towards a political um, official, towards a branch of government, towards a company, towards somebody saying, you have to do this. Take this mandatory action. And that's what Marbury is asking here. He's asking the courts to force Madison to deliver his appointment. When the Constitution was created, the role of the judiciary was considered very important. In Federalist Number 78, Alexander Hamilton said the judiciary from the nature of its functions will always be the least dangerous to the political rights of the Constitution. Meaning this, the judiciary is probably supposed to be the most apolitical branch of our government because the judiciary is guided by the Constitution, not by political goals or values. And so that's why Hamilton said it should be the least dangerous of all the branches because it's not influenced by politics. Instead, its only influence should be the U.S. Constitution. Well, guess who is the Chief Justice by this point? Yeah, we have a new Secretary of State who's a Democratic Republican, but we have a new Chief Justice of the Supreme Court who's a Federalist. So the obvious answer is going to be that, that Marshall's going to rule in favor of Marbury. But his dilemma is, should he be motivated by political ideologies or by the Constitution? And what he's going to do is he's going to do his job. And he's going to let the Constitution drive the decision-making processes. Marshall and the court determined unanimously that the Judiciary Act of 1789 was unconstitutional because they said that Congress can't tell the court what it can and can't do. Only the Constitution can. And the Constitution does not give the court the authority to issue a writ of mandamus on another branch of government. So he, re he rules in favor of Madison. This is what we call now judicial review. For the very first time in our history, the Constitution is used to determine the value or constitutionality of a law. Mar uh, Marshall said it's emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what 
the law is. In this one decision, John Marshall created the purpose of the Supreme Court to interpret the law. And so when we look back, at instances like the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions where Jefferson and Madison argue that it's really the states who determine whether or not laws are constitutional, Marshall's actions here basically overturn that and say, no, it is the power of the courts to determine it. And again, the courts can only use the Constitution to make their decisions nothing else. This idea of judicial review started us on the path where the Supreme Court can declare laws unconstitutional. In, in, the, in this case, a law passed by Congress. What's interesting is even though Marshall ruled in favor of the Jefferson administration in Marbury v. Madison, he's still a Federalist. And I just want to remind you the different viewpoints or the different ideologies that both the Federalist and the Republicans hold. Just as a reminder, with regards to federalism, the federalists believe in a strong central government versus strong state governments with Republicans. They believe in state rights. The, the federalists believe in a loose interpretation of the Constitution, whereas the Republicans believe in a strict interpretation. Under those guidelines, the National Bank would be supported by the Constitution as far as the federalists are concerned but not as far as the Republicans are concerned. They said it's not in the Constitution, so they can't do it. Federalists supported commerce and the urban lifestyle, whereas Republicans supported agriculture, the agrarian lifestyle. And they also differ on how the Constitution should be interpreted. Through Marbury v. Madison, Marshall has set the precedent that the Supreme Court interprets the Constitution. Again, that overrules what happened during the whole debate about the Alien and Sedition Acts when Jefferson wrote the Kentucky Resolution who said that states should interpret the Constitution. It's going to be the Federalist viewpoint that wins out on this one. We still, to this day, look to the Supreme Court to interpret our Constitution. So that's it. Just a quick overview of the Marshall Court and how we came to establish judicial review in our country. There's going to be a number of cases that John Marshall is going to listen to. He's going to sit as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court for, I think, almost 30 years. And every single decision he makes actually leads to a stronger central government, which actually ties directly to his Federalist values. So though the Supreme Court is supposed to be apolitical and the least dangerous branch of government with regards to political motivations, there's still some in there, and there always will be because it's humans who sit on the court. But that's it. Hopefully you learned something. If not, video's here. You can watch it anytime you want, but we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.